I'm Rebecca King Ferraro. And I'm Michael Sean Breeden. And you're listening to Conversations on Dance. This week on Conversations on Dance, we are joined by Cassandra Trenary, a principal dancer with American Ballet Theater. Cassandra tells us about her leap of faith to pursue ballet, what it's like to be an ABT lifer, the challenges of the pandemic, and ultimately her promotion to principal dancer. Catch Cassandra on stage with ABT. For more information, visit abt.org. Cassie, thank you so much for joining us on your day off. It's a beautiful Sunday morning in the city, uh, <laughs> but you are taking your time to be here with us. So we love that. So thank you so course. much. No, thank you so much for having me. I mean, y'all are you're the best. And we, you know, the community loves you. And I was excited to be invited. So thanks for having me. Thank you. So since it's your first time on the podcast, we always do some sort of throwback to hear about, you know, your beginnings in ballet. What made you fall in love with ballet to begin with? Sure, sure, sure. Um, Okay, let's see. I... I started dancing in Georgia in a town called Lawrenceville. My my mom, my my parents just kind of threw me into everything. I think it was clear very early on in my life that I was like, <laughs> she's a performer. <laughs> 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 so I did like all sorts of things. I was just like, I rode horses and I did, you know, the, uh, gymnastics for a hot second. I was like in doing sports and like taekwondo la 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 but you know throughout my youth um dance and ballet is just kind of the thing that stuck and that mm-hmm. I fell in love with and I think you know the music the community um I was wanting to take on as many dance styles as possible and ballet kind of really became the focus um around my first summer intensive and it was an American Ballet Theater summer intensive um I didn't want to be far from home we auditioned for actually I only auditioned for two and it was the SAB summer intensive and it was the ABT Alabama summer intensive and I was devastated I did not get into the SAB summer intensive I remember it was my first year on point and they had us like coming into the center during pirouettes and I was mortified. I was like, I haven't even left the bar yet. I'm scared. And, but but my dream was to be in New York and I didn't Mm -hmm. have a lot of knowledge of what this world was. Could it even be a job? Like we weren't there yet. Like there was no, that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Um, But my teachers, my training, it was, it was really strong and in Georgia and they saw my potential and they just wanted to like push me out of the nest. So, but ABT Alabama accepted me. And that was kind of the first time that I was surrounded by young people. I was 12 at the time. They were as invested and obsessed with it as I was. Mm -hmm. And it kind of made me feel like, okay, this is my, this is my crew. This is my crowd. I, I got to have a lot more education and I got to see, you know, video footage and for the first time because it wasn't accessible in what year was this like 2005 maybe Mm -hmm. um but yeah from there I I think those three weeks really transformed me and sort of showed that I had potential to go all the way with this and that was really special and there was just kind of that shift you know Mm -hmm. just so wild to think so I look at these 12 year olds now and I'm like how on earth do you know anything about anything like (laughs) Why did my parents trust me when I was like, so oh, this is what I'm going to do now? And they're like, yeah, yeah. okay. It's so wild. Like, we're so weird. Like, I'm, I'm sure y'all had this yeah. experience. Of it's like, what? What on earth? I know. Um, but then I went to the ABT Summer Intensive in New York after that. They invited me to New York to on scholarship. And then I joined the JKO school for a year. And then the studio company brought me on tour for a year. And then I joined ABT. And so just kind of like ABT, just like, grab yeah. hold of me and and <laughs> yeah. that was it and I think the thing that really um you asked why why did I fall in love with it I think the the ballet that I saw where I really was like oh this is something that speaks to me was Macmillan's Romeo and Juliet mm. I remember watching that as a kid and just feeling like it was the first time I saw more of like a, a humanity tied into the 
the classical shapes and the lines and everything right. that we're striving for so desperately and um, the sort of cinematic quality of that work. Mm-hmm. I was like, wow, that that's interesting to me or whatever my like 13 year old brain felt at the time. Um, right. Yeah. I just kind of wanted to dive into it um, to this company because that's mm-hmm. what I, what I saw. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I you know, I, you're, across the plaza of peers, you know, New York City Ballet, like all those principles have been through, SA, most of them have been through SAB and been like, it's just very normal for you to be there your whole life. But your trajectory is pretty unusual. There are maybe a couple of you that, you know, did those summer programs from 12 and then went to JKO school. And um, so, but what's that, I guess, been like being like, I'm an, an ABT lifer, if you will, like you're a do or die. <laughs> You've been through it every step of the way. I guess it's like it's a combo platter. I'm I'm so grateful that you know this organization and and whoever might have been running the different um facets of it just saw potential in me and like they're not all of them are, are around anymore so much like um Nancy Rafa was the president of the or whatever the title might be of the summer intensives at the time. And she saw me in Alabama and she was the one now she's a director of rep at ABT. She like mm-hmm. saw me and she was like, this girl needs to be in New York. And then Franco DeVita, who was the the school's director at the time, saw me in the summer intensives. And he's like, we need you in the school. So it was just I had these little champions and I'm grateful for that. Mm-hmm. Um that has always been extremely meaningful to me. Um, and then, you know, the directors of Rep and ABT who <laughs> needed a, a girl my height and I was in the right place at the right time in the school. Um, mm-hmm. So I think it's almost felt just like this intense journey that I was just kind of like, I'm just like along for the ride. I mean, I've always been working so hard and kind of just focused on being the best I can be. And then the stars kind of aligned in a lot of ways. You know, I think timing was such a, it was so important in that. But your question, sorry, I'm, I get all like, blah, 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 but <laughs> um, your question was, what's it like to be an ABT lifer? Um, I mean, it feels incredible to have gotten to this level. Like I can still so clearly, you know, especially coming out of COVID, there's a lot of gratitude kind of reflecting on that 12 year old and thinking like, my God, like you, you got, you got to exactly where you'd hoped you would. And that's yeah. so exciting. Mm-hmm. And yet I think, I mean, this is an odd story, but I was also promoted when ABT wasn't working. It was the middle of the pandemic and I, I had even ask. hung, yeah, I'd hung up my point shoes. I was like, I'm a contemporary dancer now. Like, <laughs> I was like, I don't know if I'm going back. And there was like a freedom in sort of being okay with that. We just didn't know what the future held. Didn't know if our job was going to even exist anymore. Um, and so now I feel like I'm kind of just beginning in a lot of ways. And um, being in New York has also, I'm grateful ABT for being in New York because it's allowed me to collaborate with so many fantastic artists along the way and it's a city that if you're you know if you're looking for it can really just breed a lot of artistic growth Mm -hmm. um and I don't know I'm excited to see what happens now like Mm -hmm. I don't know I don't know where that is or what that looks like but the journey so far has been all over the place (laughs) but I'm I'm grateful to be here it is crazy though to think back on all of it because like I um yeah and it's like it ABT I've grown up in this company and in this organization yeah Yeah. what's maybe you know you were basically saying like the the two keys to your success are timing and of course your own hard work you know that that piece if we didn't have that piece it would be worth nothing but maybe you could take us to an example of like what some of your first good timing was was there an opportunity that you had um due to certain circumstances or whatnot like what what were some of your first things you got once you had been accepted into the main company no for sure i mean um I think I've had all these sort of outside champions coming in. Like the first person who gave me a major opportunity, I was still an apprentice in the company, was Demi Svolpe. He had been hired to choreograph a work for ABT. This would have been in 2011. 
and he gave me a principal role in the ballet. I was wow. second cast. Um, and I was so like just head down and focused that I don't think I, I even realized what an extraordinary opportunity it really was. I was just like mm -hmm. working. And I think, you know, people saw me very early on um, in a featured role like that as someone who is a curious dancer, someone who, you know, I, I love taking on different movement vocabularies. Like I'm always kind of stretching myself as much as possible um, in that way. And I'd come out of a studio that offered all of that. Right. right. So that was really um, special as well. So being um, open to contemporary movement and having a background in, in dancing contemporary rep it was like as a student it was a uh, yeah I think it just kind of showcased what what I was capable of very early on and Ratmansky was around at that time and and he saw me and um was a huge champion of every you know my past 10 years in this company I'm I, I'm so grateful to him so like it wasn't long after that that he started sort of grabbing hold of me he had me um premiere his what is what's her name princess florine and his mm, yeah. um brand new sleeping beauty you know as um a brand new soloist so i think but that demi's multi opportunity was like major and also daniel simkin like he was always sort of like getting groups together and always included me in in those groups and was a champion of mine as well so yeah i don't know i'm just kind of like whoever wants me i'm around <laughs> <laughs> did you take very easily would you say to some of these opportunities or were was it really nerve-wracking for you especially like when you're talking about as an apprentice learning a principal role what did that feel like for you did that feel very organic I think, oh God, that's such a good question. It was so long ago now, but <laughs> I think what I appreciated, what I, what I remember feeling was that because it was um, sort of an abstract work and a, a, a contemporary like rep piece um, that everybody was in the room together as equals and nobody made me feel differently. And I appreciated that a lot. Right. And it felt very much like, you know, I was in the studio making a dance. Like I had just come out of school having that experience. So it, in a way it, it did feel organic. Um, and when I'm on stage, I can't, I don't even like think about anything. I mean, other than like, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like I, I just no go panic. blank. I yep. <laughs> The moments before I am like, oh my God. I mean, it's gotten worse as I've gotten older, I have to say. I think younger, I'm I'm less I was less afraid. I think you if just I'm didn't really know being to be honest, scared, right? Literally. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and it's like, I think now <laughs> the like the challenge is finding that again. Right. right. It's like at that time it was like there was a definitely I had a fearlessness, I think, in a um, and I was also so well guided, like to have something created on you, with you, for you, there is, there, there's a sense that like, you can't really go wrong necessarily. Okay. And especially as like a young person, you're just like, I was just so thrilled to be there that mm -hmm. I think that, um, joy kind of <laughs> translated into confidence somehow. And, yeah. and like when I'm on stage, I just, uh, I love, I love it so much. And, um, I think that that's never gone away, but I, I just remember feeling like, so in my body in a way that I had never felt before getting to step on stage with the company like that in that way. And I had great partners. I was with Blaine Hoven. He was my partner. I remember in that piece and we had no, we didn't know each other. And he was probably like, why am I dancing with this little girl? Uh, <laughs> and we giggle about it now from time to time. We'll be like, never forget. <laughs> A bond forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, something I, I think about at ABT um, that I find kind of fascinating is that, 
you know, the rep, your bread and butter is are these full lengths where the leap from the step down from Aurora is Princess Florine. But, you know, that's like you get a pot da cute little pot da and then you do your little variation and then you're done. But, you know, they're, they're, that's the graduation. Like that is something people like you end up as principals, you all have to go through. And it's really like a baptism by fire because you don't just get to like, okay, here's my mixed rep bill. And, you know, I, I did this little thing and then, you know, or even something like I just saw Ballad de la Regina last night, really, really hard, but it's 20 minutes and you're done and that's it. Like, mm-hmm. how do you mentally prepare for that jump from Florine to Aurora? Like, I, I just I can't wrap my head around it. I know. I, I mean, if I had to do it now, it would, I'd probably be like, I don't know. <laughs> no, but I, <laughs> I, I think it's so true. I think what's special about having those little, like, you know, the diverts in all of these ballets is it does give you an opportunity, um, to sort of share like what makes you special as an artist. Like how can you, um, create a narrative where perhaps there isn't one. Is that Mm -hmm. how you cling to it? Or is it that you are just looking forward to showcasing this part of your technique that you know is like you've got in the bag? Or um, (laughs) So I think it's just kind of like little like stepping stones to to getting to that place as you mentioned, Michael. But I mean, when when it came to Sleeping Beauty, I I think it was It was that we had built that entire ballet like from scratch with Ratmansky and he was hold quite literally just like holding our hands and feet throughout the entire thing that by the time I got the opportunity to dance Aurora, which was a year after it had been created, I felt like I I had a handle on this whole ballet from every single mm. angle in a way because he he just emphasizes the importance of storytelling no matter who you are in the ballet right um and i think that that's very special and so at that point like i had done diamond fairy garland waltz the mazurka or the polonaise or whatever and like the the courtiers and the the this one the the canary fairy the canary <laughs> fairy yeah. i'm like what, what's it what um <laughs> fingers fingers, fingers. <laughs> like those three guys and um <laughs> and then of course like florine and like and learned the cat like i'd learned all these things but mm-hmm. to prepare for it like he was with me every step of the way i mean he I'll never forget. This is a really sweet story, but we had finished the run of Sleeping Beauty in California when it had opened. And I was like carrying my theater case into the elevator and he was getting out of the elevator. And I had not done every single role in the ballet from (laughs) the core about the core roles to like the, you know, Princess Florine, like in a week, like three things every single night. And he looked at me and he was like, said some really sweet things and then right as the elevator doors were closing he was like you should do aurora and i was like and it was like, just oh. like bing, bing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. and i remember just like beaming i was like what on earth oh like my gosh. i was like did i just imagine that and like lo and behold like the following year i was cast to dance it and oh. he taught me he he and Irina kopakova would sit at the front of the room and they just like morphed me into this character and each act feeling like a completely different you know woman um so it was i think And not every ballet, I would have to say, like, I've done other full lengths and have never quite felt as comfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because he just gives you every single thought, every intention. We'll have conversations about each of those beats. And that is what sort of makes the potata, makes the variation. Like, everything has to have a, a thought behind yeah. it um and an action so I felt so prepared I felt so ready 
And I knew that all I had to do was cling to those like beats right. and, and thoughts. And it was almost so much information that I didn't have the time to be scared or in my head or I'm, I'm sure, I mean, this was, this was a long time ago now, but I'm, I'm sure that those things existed too. But what I do remember is feeling totally sure of exactly what I needed to do in every single moment. And that felt mm. so good. I mean, mm. and I was 22. I'm sure there was also that the first time I did it, that, that feeling of like, I'm too young to be scared also. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I think if I were to tackle that ballet now at 30, I probably would be a lot more afraid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, I love that. I, I mean, it's making me think of experiences I've had where I w- like I got thrown into this ballet, You're the Rabbit, once. And oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I had one rehearsal for it, but my Janie Taylor was staging it. And we went through oh. the whole thing. Like I had something to think about for every second of the solo. So it's like you have this map and you are guided by the map you don't have to you can tune out the the d- demons the bad voices because you're just like yes. no this i have to think about this there's no there's no there is no blank space for that that's totally what it made me think of when you have a good mm-hmm. guide when you have someone caring for you in that way it can be so true. liberating actually it makes all the difference it makes mm-hmm. all the difference and i and i have carried that experience with me into everything i've done since because i mean not everybody can give you that map Mm -hmm. so how are you going to create it for yourself um as sort of the next step and something that i still try to do with with everything that i'm given now yeah i just want to talk a little bit more about ratmansky for a second because he's such a dance historian too he's so interested in the history behind all of this and for something like sleeping beauty that obviously has such a rich history how is he prompting you and communicating some of the history behind it too to kind of help enrich your performance. Yeah, it's funny. I I can't think of an example of Aurora off the top of my head other than the fact that we would come back to it a few more times um because we also performed in act 3 independently um as its own work at one point as well. Um and he would share the the notations with me um videos multiple videos of like um Carla Fracci and others that that were just so exquisite and yet he would say this is what i like about this video it's her expression mm-hmm. it's her hands it's her line this is what i like about so and so's video and he would send me that video he'd be like look at her footwork this is what I like about it. So there was sort of um, just this ongoing, like all these layers to sort mm-hmm. of like incorporate. Um, and he would have little stories. He would he would have so much knowledge. Like I uh, also I'm just the worst with names and dates and times. So you'll have Same. to excuse <laughs> me. Don't worry. But, so like everyone's like, oh, you know, so much about ballet. I'm like, I know nothing. I know absolutely nothing. I don't. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. I, but but when it comes to like. Um, there was a, you know, the Cinderella in Act Three of uh, Sleeping Beauty. Um, he was able to explain to us like the reason that it's quite literally just these little runs around the stage is because the original ballerina had like the most beautiful feet, and he was obsessed with her ankles, and so that's why oh. this is the step. So it's, uh-huh. it's kind of cool to to understand the context for which really? all of this was created as well, because I think it, it's so true in, in how we operate now. Like I had the opportunity to, um, you know, uh, like God rest, uh, work with Lynn Seymour mm. on Romeo and Juliet. And I working with her in the studio, I now am like, this is why the choreography ended up the way it did. So off balance, so overcrossed, so sort of like liquid in the spine, because that's just how her body was Mm -hmm. naturally. And it's really challenging to kind of replicate that. But yeah, so I I just love that. And even now, like I, I have things made on me and I'm curious, like, how will that translate on other bodies? You know, um, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm just thinking of that. Like, I when I, when I stage things, I always talk about the ballerinas that was made on. If, you know, maybe they don't understand. You know what 
the mind or character of this person is in real life, like that colors what the choreographer was doing. And I think I do sure. think that's an important thing to know. Also, it's just like you you saying like, oh, I don't know anything about ballet, but then you literally like you made it your own imperative to seek out Lynn Seymour. It's also like you said, you like you have the opportunity, but it was like that was because you made that happen and right. you sought her out and. I think that that means, you know, a few things about ballet. <laughs> I did. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it is so important to go back to the source, right? Like to your point. And I think it's, and it's, it's not to replicate, right? Like I think right, that's exactly. like every dancer's worst nightmare too, is like, it's how you present this information. Cause if someone comes in and they say, well, so-and-so did it like this and you have to replicate that, like, like I want to vomit it's like it's it's so stifling so it's more about like having all of this information to then understand why the movement is the way it is and then you can sort of create your your version of that right with with what you're given um aesthetically well it's like what what Ratmansky was telling you I like these feet I like the hands here like and that's helping you also moving forward to say, I see something and I like this and I can replicate that on my body, but I don't like this. That wouldn't look good on me. You know, it kind of helps you continue that path of finding what's right for you and your body. Exactly. Exactly. I love that. That's that's, that's important. That's fun. That's fun to me. Yeah. Yeah. Can we um, hear the story about your promotion? Because I was looking that it was what, September 2020. I was thinking, I was like, hmm, I wonder how this went down. And I'm wondering too, if you even thought that was something that could happen at that time. No, you're shaking your head. No, (laughs) it was so crazy. I mean, I was actually talking to Skylar Brandt about this the other day, how Uh we were just like giggling because we were like, we, I couldn't have predicted that. Like when COVID ended or COVID began, I I was preparing to make my Juliet debut and mm-hmm. I was a soloist and I was like, I hope to be a principal dancer one day. But, and I thought maybe after I get a couple more full lengths under my belt, maybe in like a few years that could happen. But then the whole world shut down. Everything changed. Everything yeah, right. changed. Mm-hmm. Priorities changed. Um, but to set the scene for you, I. I had just come out of um, working on a few projects. Um, I was in Kotzbahn. I had just done a residency with Sonia Taya. Um, We were preparing a work for the Guggenheim that was slated to happen the following year. And then I actually um, was invited by Lauren Post, who's the director of Collab Dance, to choreograph, which I was really excited about. And we ultimately ended up going to Cotspot and using our residency as um, an opportunity to create a dance film. Um, so I was in the midst of sort of being my like <laughs> barefoot in the grass in the woods, like <laughs> <laughs> moving and grooving and like working with some of my best friends. We had such an amazing time and like, especially coming out of a time where we hadn't seen each other in forever and we were making, it was really special. But in the process of making this film, um, Kotspan was also having uh, the only like dance festival happening at that time, right? So there were other right. artists kind of visiting the property and then leaving and visiting and then leaving. So it was this like constant, um, like revolving door of brilliant right. artists, like, like from all these different companies, it was such a special time to like get to connect with all these people. But so all of that to say it was the end of a rehearsal day, or maybe we had even been filming that day. And we were at, there's a gatehouse at the front of the property where there's a kitchen and there were outdoor picnic tables. And everybody who was there that weekend was gathered around this table and we were like cooking meals together. And so we were all, and I just saw, I got an email from, um, Kevin McKenzie, um, who's the artistic artistic director at the time, uh, his assistant had reached out and said, you know, um, Kevin's wondering if you're going to be at the meeting tomorrow morning, like one of a thousand Zoom meetings that we'd probably had that. And I was like, no, (laughs) I am not going to be here. I was like, um, I was so fed up at that point. I mean, it was, it was, we were just so frustrated by, um, 
you know, the fact that we didn't know what was going on. So I was yeah. like, I, I don't want to go to another Zoom meeting where I'm going to be told that we still don't know. Right. And so she says, okay, well, then he's going to give you a call now. And I'm looking at my phone. I'm like, it's 945 at night. Like, what is he about to tell me? And oh at this my, point, I would also, be so scared. Well, to give you a little bit more context, um, ABT had started devising a plan to do these bubbles. Right. Um, right. These like artists. So like I thought I had already said no to one. So I thought he was calling to convince me oh. to do a bubble. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And I'm like rolling my eyes and I like look at my friends and I'm like, like Isabella is there and like mm-hmm. um, Isadora and like some coworkers and dear friends. And I was like, you know, um, I have to go take care of this guy's like eye roll. Like, so I walk into the kitchen and he gives me a call and he's like, hi, how's it going? I was like, oh, it's good. You know, like we're having a great time. I'm really excited about what we're making. La la la. Just kind of like waiting for the pitch. And he goes, well, I hear you're not coming to the meeting tomorrow. So I think (laughs) now is the time to tell you that you're a principal dancer. And like my heart just like dropped into my stomach and I was just like overwhelmed with emotion. And I was like, what? I think I just kept repeating, are you serious? And it was mixed feelings because the first question was, of what company? (laughs) Amazing. And the second was like, well, like what? I was just like, wow. But also, of course, like this is this was what I had dreamed of. And also a little angry that I was robbed of the way that it naturally right. happens. Totally. Um, mm-hmm. So there were so many conflicting emotions there. Sure. And I mentioned briefly too earlier that I hadn't put my point shoes on in eight months. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> so I was thinking to myself, like, I'm prepared to, I, I had got, I had become at peace with the idea of never reaching that goal. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so to have it realized was so, I mean, I, I, of course it was a dream come true and it, it, it felt so validating as well, because at that point I had done all of these full lengths and I had worked so hard and it was such a sad time. So it was welcome relief as well. Right. Um, And I think I was surrounded by all of these special people who I hadn't connected with before. When I came out of that house, I just started like sobbing. I was like, whoa, it was like all this emotion from like such a challenging time period just kind of came out of me in that moment. And they all were like, are you okay? Like what happened? And I like, I was like, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a principal dancer. And they were like, and like everybody oh. like surrounding me and it was really so special yeah. um but crazy mm. so crazy and so unexpected <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. at least like when you're dancing, you kind of know like, okay, around this time is when people find out, you know, sorry, when you're dancing, when you're like at the theater or, you know, yeah. like you kind of like know and you're like, maybe it could be. But like for something like that, like it's just that's why I always am so curious about the COVID promotions because they pro- came out of nowhere. It feels a little bit. I know. You know? And I think you've done just... the work, of course, but like you just didn't know what could happen. Right. Like literally, and I think it's it's kind of hilarious too how I I was just kind of it's it's just kind of a a situation where I feel like the pattern in my life has been sort of the second I relax or let go of something that I've been holding so tight to, or like specifically in like career career stuff. When I'm like, all right, you know what? I surrender. It's like, boom. I'm like, what? No, it's not how it's supposed to happen. (laughs) Um, So this is like a sweet example of that. Um, And I think too, I was just like, all right, let's go. I don't know what it's going to look like, but. I got to put those point shoes on tomorrow morning. (laughs) Like I was like, all right, time to do my relevance. Um, But I think what I appreciated about that moment too, is I was in a place now where I got to sort of decide like well what do I want do I want this do I and um 
and that I think was a privileged place to be in to sort of yeah. be in, in a, in a place like mentally and, and even like physically in that moment, like, um, kind of, a coming into my own as a person <laughs> separate right. from the identity as a dancer, um, to kind of be like, all right, yeah, I do want that. I do want that. And this is what I've worked so hard for. And I don't know what it's going to look like. And I don't know when we're going to be even physically together again, but yeah. that was exciting. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Well, I have to run to the ballet, but you do. That's you're, right. what you're most looking forward to um, this Met season. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, I'm really excited to revisit Christopher Wielden's like water for chocolate mm. um, that I, I had the best experience in and I'm dancing with Armand Cornejo and he's celebrating 25 years. Wow. So it's going to be major. Um yeah, I'm thrilled about that one. And we are uh, doing Wolfworks by Wayne McGregor, mm -hmm. which is a huge shift for ABT. And I'm super excited about that, too. Um, we're actually learning with... that. Sorry, Go I was going to say, have you been working with Antoine? Yes. Oh, Antoine my gosh. We love Antoine. Antoine, for those who don't know, Antoine, uh, who has the last name I don't dare pronounce on this podcast. Um, <laughs> but he's, he's the stager for Wayne McGregor. And I I was staging a ballet in Hong Kong when he was there doing something as well. So he's just the absolute oh. best. What a joy. Heaven. I, I'm jealous. Yeah, he's so sweet. We're having a ball in the studio. Everybody's been so kind and knowledgeable and patient with us. And we're all like really, really stoked. So it's yeah. going to be, yeah, it's going to be a good season. Thank awesome. you. Well, we need to have you back on. There's so much that we did not even begin to touch but I know, we'll, do, we'll do cassie part two, two for sure. <laughs> oh i'd love that y'all are the best because yeah. i actually wanted to ask questions about y'all and sit in miami city ballet and like oh, i had i actually too. had a list of questions myself but okay, <laughs> time. we'll do it all next right. time <laughs> all right thanks so much cassie thank, thank you, you so much, much. Conversations on Dance is part of the ACAST Creator Network. For more information, visit conversationsondancepod.com.